Okay, so um, we started from the, well, the concept of machine learning yesterday, and uh, we all agree that machine learning is a way of um, giving instructions to the machine or our computer or an algorithm to design rules or to look for patterns from the example data we supply to it without explicitly designing rules for the computer. So we allow the machine to make informed decision to, de to look for patterns in the data based on uh, exa experience, okay? This experience is what we refer to as example data. And we said there are two types of uh, machine, uh, basically three types of machine learning. We said we have the supervised learning, the unsupervised and the reinforcement learning. And then we said for this course, we're going to focus on supervised learning. And supervised learning by supervised, we mean that our the machine or the algorithm or the, yeah, or the model as an example, like a teacher, a guide, something to teach it, uh, to help it look for patterns. So we said that guide is the example output or the target in our data that is teaching the algorithm or the machine on how to go about looking for the data, uh, looking for patterns. So. And then we said we have two types of this supervised learning. So remember for supervised learning, there is, an, there is a column that represents the example of the output that we, we want to predict. Yes, so there is that column. It could be the price. In terms of Ms. Aloze's example, it could be the oil production. It could be the pricing of, the, of a house or the sales of a house, things like that, weather forecast, it could be, so there is an example to guide the model. So, and we have two types, we have the regression and we have the classification. So we said the regression, the goal of the regression is to predict a numeric output. Like the examples I just gave now, sales of a particular product, weather forecast, uh, oil production, things like that. And the other type is a classification where in which the goal is to predict the, a, the categories of a particular uh, event. Like you want to build a model to predict whether a customer will, uh, will churn, meaning we will leave a particular, uh, we leave uh, a brand. Or you want to build a model to predict whether a patient has cancer or not. So, categories, cancer or no cancer, leave uh, a brand or not leave a brand, things like, so that's classification. We have an example here, fraud detection. So you are building a model to detect whether a fraud has taken place or not. So we can encode it as zero means no fraud. One means there's a fraud. It depends on your encoding. Image classification. You want to classify whether an image is a dog or a cat. So you can be the model to do that, okay? Um, so those are, we have those two types as uh, machine, uh, the types of machine learning. Supervised, which is broken down to category, uh, classification and regression. And we said some terminologies that basically before you build your model, you all you have is data. You have to split the data into minimum of two, training and testing. But much more, if you want to really, really do it, build, divide it into three sets so that you use one part to, to build the model, which is the training data. You use another part to, uh, to, mod, to adjust the parameters of the model. Like you will see today, we can use the validation uh, set to do that. And finally, when you are satisfied with your model, you can finally test it on the testing set. You don't want to expose the model to the testing set at the very beginning so that your model will not be overly optimistic. Meaning, because once it's exposed to the testing set, the model can quickly recognize how the data is 
and may perform well, but that doesn't mean it will perform well if you give it a fresh data. So that's why we normally keep a fresh data separately that the model will not see at all to simulate how a future example of data will look like. Okay. And then we show the life cycle of, of model training. Like, okay, you start with the data, you divide it into training and testing, you use the training to build, to train the model, which produce a model, and you define a metric, something to measure where your model is performing, which we, in this case, we can use what we call accuracy. As we go on, we see, I will expose us to all that type of metric that you can design. Like, not really that you can design, they have been designed that you can use, like precision, like record, like what we call the half measure. You will see all of that maybe in subsequent classes. And then when you are, after you've gotten a metric like the accuracy, you check that metric also on the test, on the test data to be sure your model is not just performing well on the training, but also doing well on the test set. And then we put a question here that what happens when our model perform better on the training data, but worse on the test data? What do we call that kind of scenario? When our model perform well on the training, but worse on the testing? What do we call that? Overfitting. Overfitting. Good. You guys are great. So we call that overfitting. So that means our model perform well on the training, meaning it memorizes the patterns but including the noise, those things that are not necessary. It memorizes all of that. It's trying to perfectly uh, uh, understand all the patterns, but in doing that, it also captures the noise and the unnecessary things in the, in the data. So as a result of that, the model is nearly perfect on the training, but it's so much weak to understand the patterns in the test data, a fresh data. So that's what we call overfitting. But underfitting is when the model is too weak, it's too simple to understand the patterns in the training. So it performs poorly on the training. But because it's even weak to, to understand the patterns in the training, definitely it's also very weak to understand the pattern in the test set. So it performs poorly on both the training and the test set. That's underfitting. But the one we want is this good compromise at the middle. What which you call generalization. So when we say our model generalizes well, it means that the model gives us a very good performance on the training set, the, the, the set, the data we use to build in, and as well on unseen data, which we call the test data. It performs also very well on, on the testing set. Remember our goal, our main focus is on the test set because that's an example of future data that we, we, we are going to use the model to predict. So, and that's our goal, okay? And then we move to what we call regression. We say regression is a type of linear model. And we say linear model, what is linear model? It's actually a model that tries to find a linear relationship between our variables, which you call the independent variables or the features and our targets our, the, what we are interested in predicting, our, the why in this case, which will be the sales. So our linear model tries to find a linear relationship in that data between the features and the target. The target is the example of the output that we are interested in, okay? So, but there will be a problem which we are going to look at today if the data is not so simple such that the linear model couldn't find a linear relationship. Maybe the data is complex. So it couldn't find a linear relationship between the features and the target. Then linear, because a, you can see is a, all linear regression could do is a straight line. Linear regression is an example of linear model. So all you could find is a linear relationship. That's why you try to put a line in between the features and the target. But if the data is complex, linear regression may be very weak to find, to capture the relationship between the features and the targets. So we said we have two types. We have the simple linear regression. We have the multiple. Simple linear regression, it just means we only have one feature. And we look at that yesterday through using scikit-learn. 
But today we're going to use our own data to see an example of multiple linear regression, meaning you have more than one features. You have more than one variables in your data. Okay, and then we said that when you build a model uh, and you, you use it, you, you are trying to get, uh, uh, you, you use it to make prediction. If you obviously the model may not be perfect, so it's going to make some mistakes. It's going to perf it may it may not give you the exact thing you want. So we will try to compare what the model is predicting to the actual output, the example output we have in our data. The difference between what the model is predicting and what it's supposed to be predicting, which is the example of the data we have, example of the output we have, is what we call the error. One way, keep this at the back of your mind, one metric, which is that accuracy that is measuring the, like trying to find, to, to measure the error, the mistake our model is making, we say it's accuracy, but specifically for regression, that accuracy means mean squared error, MSE for short. That's ex what the accuracy means for regression. Okay, that's a metric to measure the error from uh, our model is making for regression problem, mean squared error, MSE for short. Any question before we uh, move on? Do we have understand that recap? Does it make yeah. sense? Does it resonate yeah. to clear as it make us refresh our memory? Does it? On my side, yes. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. Good. So let's look at our. Uh, uh, Okay, so this is a Jupyter notebook. So this was where we stopped yesterday. We, we, we used example, a data in the uh, Maglen package called make wave. And then we use the cycle length. We said the linear regression, <laughs> sorry, uh, excuse me. We said the linear regression is inside the linear model package. So we created an instance of it and save it as LR. Then we train the model here by using dot fit and we're passing the training X train and Y train. And then we said we can get the coefficient. Remember the coefficient are the W's. That's, ex that's, what, that's the main reason why we are building this model. The model is trying to come up with the appropriate WUs, appropriate coefficients that we help the model to predict the actual uh, correct Y. And that's, that's the Y can be the sales or housing price or whatever we're interested in. Okay, so today we're going to con continue that and rest like start again by using our own data so that we can see how to clearly separate the features and the targets like end-to-end -end, uh, machine learning model using regression. Are you ready? Do you have this data already? The Austin data, do you have it? Yes. Awesome. So this, so I have it in the path, in this path, I, I already have a folder called data inside my anaconda. So this data is there. So this, you, this should represent the, your own path on your computer. So we load it using pandas. Do you remember how to load this? Let's call this housing. Who, who want to help me? So how do we load it? Let's import pandas as PD. If I have not forgotten, who want to help me? That would be PD dot. Yes. Read underscore SCV. Exactly. CSV. Mm -hmm. Then I will be part. God bless you, sir. So we read this. Okay. And then it's telling me error. This must be from me. Let's see. Oh, it's telling me no, no such directory. So let's see. Maybe I think I have it in the data. I'll send data. Yeah, I do. So what happened? Um, PD dot read underscore CSV. Uh, OK. 
Okay. Let me see. Yeah, that's weird. Let's see again. Mm, let me see. What am I missing? Uh, Okay, yeah, so I have, so we can check the head. Okay, so this is my, these are the data. All of these uh, columns that you're seeing, they actually acronyms, they mean uh, uh, something. Um, okay, so I can't remember everything. This is the, this stands for the age of the house. This is actually our output, the target we're interested in. In our data, this is the last column, but it will not always be the last column. You should know the target in your data. Just the, you need to find that. But in this case, we have it as the tag, the last column, but it doesn't always, it's not always like that, okay? So we have other variable like the number, average number of rooms, things like that. Uh, uh, so, I mean, these all have documentations, but I, I don't have them here, okay? So you can, ex you can inspect it, remember? You can always, you can check maybe the number of, the, the number of rows and column, how do I do that? How do I check the dimension of the data? Sheep. Is that what happened? Dot info, dot info. Okay, dot info or dot shape. So if you do dot info, you have a lot you have. It shows you the number of rows, which is 506. Uh, well, from here, we have to count the number of columns, which is 14 here, which are 14. Then it tells us the data types. So we can see that there are no missing value. No, 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 no for everything, 506 non-null, which is the same as the 506 rows. So, but if you want to specifically check the dimension, you can just use uh, the dot shape. Okay, so we have housing dot shape. And so that means we have 506 rows, 14 columns. If you want to check the column names, you can use housing dot columns and things like that. You can check some descriptive statistics like describe. We've, we've looked at all of these before. Uh, okay, so this tells us kind of like the average, the mean of each of the variables, the minimum and the maximum. You can see the minimum in this case, like from 0 0.006 to 88. Another one range from 0 0.46 to 27. Another one is zero to one. So they are not, they are not, the scale is different. One is just between zero and one. This one is between zero and 88 or 89. And that one is just between three and this. So we might need to bring, to scale them, to bring them to similar scales before we start building our model. Pay attention to that. It's always a good practice to always scale, we call it normalize. To always normalize your data, bring them to similar scale before you start building the model. Because if you don't do that, uh, if the, the, the ranges of the date of the variables in your data are very, very different, there may be some are very small, some are large, the one that have high ranges can actually overshadow all other features that have six small numbers. So that way your model may not perform very well. So it's always a good practice to standardize or to scale or to normalize your data. You are saying the same thing. Okay, are we good? So we can also check for any correlations in our data to be sure that some variables are not correlated. By correlation, I mean, you want to check the relationship between the variables. You can check the relationship between 
the variables like one, one, the, one variable to the other to be sure because if they are very correlated, the high high correlation, correlation is between zero and one. The more the number, the more correlated those two variables are. And now if they are correlated, that means they actually, they, they, they have similar information, meaning they are contributing almost the same information to the model. And most times, if two more like, variables have, have high correlation, we might have to drop one of them because th that means they have similar information. There's no point uh, re repeating, you know, doing uh, re like repetitive, like, like repetition of information in the model. It can cause what we call multicollinearity and it can affect, it may make our model performer non-reliable. So if there is, any two variables or that are very, 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 very correlated, very high, we might have to drop one and do all. So those are some of those things we will go through before we start building model. You cannot just take a, a data and just start building model. No, that building model should be the last thing that you will do as a data scientist. You should explore the data. Uh, do some data manipulation, visualize it. That's why we did all of those visualization. Check for correlations in the data. By the time you are done with all of that, then you move to what we call data preparation to put your data in a format that uh, the algorithms can accept. We are gonna do that today, okay? Unfortunately, the one we did yesterday has already been put in that format, but we will have to do that ourselves today. So let's check for any correlation. So we call on our housing, and then we just do dot call, okay? And then we'll see. So you can see, you can see that CRM against the next variable, so the correlation is very low. It could be negative or positive. So anything above 0 0.7 is very high. So we can see this is just 0 0.2, 0 0.4. Uh, so the highest here is still 0 0.45. So it's not so high. Uh, so you can check for all of that. So there is one here, the media. Anyway, this is the target. So you can see that the number of rooms is kind of very high, has high relationship with our output. So that can give us an idea of the variable that is important to build the model. This is the target. So um, that's a good one to see. The number of rooms is actually have a high relationship to the housing price, which makes sense. It, it makes sense. The more the number of rooms may be, the more the price of the housing. For instance, if you want to rent a house in Lagos, you know, is like the two bedroom flat is more higher than the three bed uh, is more, I mean, three bedroom flat may be higher than two bedroom. The five bedroom will be higher than four bedrooms and three bed things like that. So this makes sense in three, you know, uh, and some other variables like that. The one you are seeing one, one, they are the same variable, like CRM with CRM, we have one correlation. So you don't pay attention to those ones. You pay attention to the variable correlation with another variable. I don't know if, do you have any question? Is there any way we can, any code we can write to sort, to sort it? Because looking at it like this can be very confusing. What do you mean confusing? Is a lot or what? Uh, yeah, it's a lot. Trying to check. <laughs> Mr. Alozi, <laughs> I don't mean, I don't know what you mean by sort. You know, like doing something like this. <laughs> so you, you can sort the values. So if you do that, uh, let's see, maybe it's an attribute. So if you do that, see, it's, 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 it's a bit big, but this is Too even more. You can see. So it's better to just check it that way. You will can't, anyway, you will just have to look at it one by one and all of that. So, yeah. <laughs> so it just, it's, it's, you have to look at it one by one. Look at each each row one by one. That's just it. Look at CRM against all of that. ZN against all of that and things like that. So, yeah. Okay. Excuse me, sir. Sir, yes. mm -hmm. 
So is there a way we can write a code, you know, that can that can um, sort um, the variable that we want based on the based on the distance, based on the co um, correlation coefficients? Maybe something like a minimum um, coefficients that we want to work with, something like that, so that from there we can be able to, you know, get the variable that we want to build our model. Okay, you know, you know, this correlation value doesn't mean it belongs to a particular value. It's just a relationship between two variables. So, so I don't understand what you guys mean by, you know, this is like CRM against ZN. This is the this is the value of correlation. CRM against another. This is the value. Except you want to break this data down. You want to do them one by one. You want to split the data before you check on correlation. That's just it. It's only going to give you the relationship between any two variables. That's all. And then you can as well, if you now like, based on that, you can begin to select the variables like that. I don't know if you get what I'm trying to say. Sir. Mm -hmm. I get, I understand, sir. Why? My whole question is that you say that any any of the values that is more than zero point seven, right? I didn't say any. That, Go ahead, do your question first. Okay. That uh, there's we have to do some other things to it. I don't I don't understand that. Please, that's why I'm trying to. Okay. So what I was back. saying is. This. I didn't say any, any. I said, if two same variables, for instance, if I have CRM, which is a variable, and as I correlation with, let's say number of rooms, which is maybe they have 0 0.8 or 0 0.9, that, that's telling me that these two variables are very related. When we say two variables are related, one thing it could mean is that they share, they have, they share similar information. Remember all of these variables are giving the model information that will help you to predict the output here, which is the median housing price, this last column. So if two variables have high correlation, that means these two variables are carrying similar information that we help the model to predict. But if they are carrying similar, for instance, for instance, let's say I have a scholarship program, huh? and the scholarship program is, uh, I want to admit, I want to give scholarship to Nigerian students to study abroad, but we want to pick one from each school. Now, I have a twin in a particular school, they are so brilliant, they are, but their intellect, their intellectual cap capacity is the same. We've tested them on every area, but we needed only one. Are we not going to drop one of them? We're going to drop one of them. How? I don't know. How the criteria to use for those ones, I don't know. So it's the same thing. They are contributing the same information. So we just drop one because if you don't drop, that means you are. It's just like repeating the same thing. They have the same information. They are giving the same information to the model. So if you leave them there, there is a problem called multicollinearity. You can read about it. Multicollinearity means more than one variable is, is saying the same thing. It's repeating and sharing similar information. So if you leave those model, those variables in that model, they can make your model not reliable because there are some variables there that are sharing similar information. So we don't, that means that we don't know which exact variable is actually sharing the important information. Is it variable A or variable B? Because A and B are very related. So we don't know which of them is actually contributing to the model. So we may have to drop one to be sure, one of the, to be sure of the one that is contributing very well to the model. I don't know if you get my explanation, sir. Yes, I think. Okay. Any other question, please? Sir, let me ask you. Let me sir. ask you a question. Looking at this data, this is like okay. 
on the in industries also, and and the Dinox NOX we have zero point seven six, uh -huh. and the same industry and DIS have zero point seven, and then under tax they have zero point seven two. Mm -hmm. Such a situation. Um, what do we consider as the minimum correlation level for us to discard? Okay, <laughs> so uh, that's and that's that's a brilliant question. Now, in discarding, also, we you also need to have an understanding of what each variable means. Do you get? You know, when you when you have okay, we know maybe we know what NOx mean. Uh, industry and based on your experience, in, because a data scientist does not just take data, he also try to understand the data. And in understanding the data, he may need to meet some, some for instance, maybe, I mean, you know, the goal is to build a model for real estate people. So I may need to work along with a, is it a realtor or what do they call them, real estate agent, who has understanding of these variables. So in that case, suppose we consider that, oh, anything above 0.7, 70% relationship between two variables is, suppose we, we consider that as being very correlated, okay? We might need now, okay, I, I will talk to a real estate uh, agent or real estate expert in, or with these variables. Which one do you think is much more important here? Are you with me, sir? You will now ask. So by that experience, I may know which one to drop. That's if the choosing the uh, the level to which you determine if they're very correlated is subjective and it is depends on you and a domain expert, which in this case could be a real estate um, specialist. Are you with me? Yes, I do understand you now. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So you don't just throw it away, no. You, that's, a data scientist doesn't work alone. You know, so he has understanding of what to do with the data, but he, like he knows what building model and all of that, but he, he doesn't just take data and just build, no. He also tried to understand the data, but trying to understand, he will have to talk to those who have expertise in that area. Otherwise, he will build an incorrect model, and which may cost the organization millions you know, our billions, whichever, whatever currency. Okay, are we all in the same page? Are we good? I am. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Okay, so, you know, we have checked that there's no missing value using the info. So you know how to do that if you want to explicitly do that. You can visualize some of the mode available. Like in this case, now, Mr. Alose brought these Indus and um, Nox. You can check it. We can quickly import matplotlib, you know, uh, doing what we've done before, matplotlib. Uh, I'm not supposed to be doing this, but matplotlib.pyplot as plt, and then we do plt dot. Let's do scatter, since we know is a is they are all quantitative variable. And then we do for the indus against, um, uh, I think, nox, if I'm correct, and then we can do plt.show. And then if you like, you can, I mean, put a label, X label, um, that's the Indus, industry or whatever it stands for, plt.y label. And then we can put Nox. That's all, we can just show it. And then you can see, you can see the pattern, it's an increasing pattern. It's not so high, but at least we can fairly see the pattern there that acts the, it supposedly stand for industry, I don't know what the NOX stands for, but as the value of this industry increases, the NOX also increases. You can see that both of them have uh, some relationship in between them. The, both of them have something similar. So you can look at these based on the correlation and try to visualize some of it so that you can explain. You know, the idea of this, you, you also want to explain the variables to non-expert, to the stakeholders, so that they can we can know which variable to focus on. In trying to build the 
the the houses before you can release them to or lease them which variable should we focus on is it based on just the number of rooms or new the how new the 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 house should be in terms of the age or this industry should be should it be close to industries or things like that you know you suppose that industry stand for industries you know, I don't, uh, so do you understand what I'm trying to say? So when you determine the correlation, you try to visualize so that you can explain what is going on in those variables. You have to be able to explain to people using pictures because you understand the technicalities. Everybody do not, uh, does not understand what you know. So you have to explain it by showing them pictures, show them. Okay, this model, there's something going between on between these two variables. Which of them should we care more about? Which of them should we focus on? Things like that. Okay, so it's a very interesting stuff as a data scientist. You know, you we you are using data to make informed decision. Okay, so suppose we have done all of that. I want to ask a question, please. Go ahead, sir. In this uh, plot we just made, mm -hmm. in, in Excel, we can actually add extra two plots or three more plots on it. The one, the one on the X is, uh, the one on the Y is NOx. We can do Y prime, putting another uh, variable there. What does Y prime stand for? Assuming we want to put another variable on, on this particular plot, how why do we do, do that? that? Sorry? Why will you do that? Assuming I want to compare three variables or four variables, plotting them against indoors, how do I do it? Not putting so, them on the so not plot side. It, you can only do that if the variable is a categorical variable. Like, let's say I have a categorical variable here, then I will have another variable to read. I can't. But if there is no categorical variable, even in Excel, you cannot do that. Even in Excel, you cannot plot three quantitative variables together as a scatter plot. You cannot. If the third variable will have to be a categorical variable, and you can do that here. So if it is, if there is a categorical variable here, I would have done it. Yeah. So if there is a third value there. I can set that third value to be the color and it will separate that using the color. And I can even do that with Seaborn using the hue uh, para arguments, all of that. Otherwise, even if you can't plot three dimensions and three variables quantitative, that's three dimension. You cannot plot that with a scalar plot. Scalar plot is two dimension, except I use a three dimensional library here, which you can, but that's much more complex. So that's it. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 All right. So suppose you are now okay with it. We want to go ahead and build our model. So what you can do, we will have to now from our data, we we need to select the variables to that we used to be, which is from here to here. Since we know this is our target, remember the target will not always be the last column, but in this case it is. So what we do is we need to select all of these or just simply drop, just simply drop the target column from the data. So that we'll be left with just the variables to build the model. Okay, so that's that's what we saw in the Maglen that that they represented by X. So we will do that here. So let's call that features, just the features alone. So we just drop. Uh, we just drop the, the target, which in this case is MEDV. And then remember when we drop that, since it's a column, we set the axis to one. That will be our features. And our target will be just the last column. We'll select that MEDV. So in this case now, in the one we use yesterday, the X is what stands as our features and the Y is what stands as our target. I can do that. I'm just using a different variable. Instead of X, I'm using features. Instead of Y, I'm using target, but you can. So we also try, this is optional, what I want to do right now. We can also make it instead of, because if you do like this, if I run it this way, let me create a new cell. 
if you can, if you check the features, it's still a data frame like this. It's still a data frame. You can see, except that the last column, the median housing price is no longer there because we have dropped it. So this is now our features alone. And our target, which is the median housing price is here. We can, instead of using a data frame, you can build a model with a data frame, but it's always good, especially if your data is very large, to convert it to a NumPy, a NumPy array, because models are very, very fast in computation using a NumPy array. So to do that, you just do dot values, but remember this is optional, uh, it's not compulsory, dot values. So when you do that, that will convert it instead of a data frame to a NumPy array. Let me run that and show you. So let's do the features again. If you do that now, you can see it's now a NumPy array. It's no longer a data frame, but it's not compulsory. It's only good, especially if you have a large data. So that's why you saw that the data we used yesterday, the built-in, they were in an array form, not a data frame because it's good to always use an array to build your model. It will save you so much computer memory and make it fast, especially if you are working with a very large data set. Any question? Are we good? How do we know how do we know the target? Because this one just told us that the med V is the target. You will know now if you have a data, for instance, uh, you have a, a Titanic data. Your goal is suppose your goal is to build a model to predict if uh, to predict uh, if someone uh, survived or not in that data. You have that data. There is a column there that is that stands for whether sur survived or not. Zero one. If you check that data, you have it. So that column, you will know from the, the, the whoever is giving you the data will always tell you. Otherwise, that means you don't know the problem you want to tackle. If the organization will tell you the, what exactly the kind of model they want you to build. For instance, they can give you a business problem that uh, um, maybe, maybe the marketing problem are trying to design a marketing campaign. At the very beginning, marketing campaign to target who? Okay, what is the, what is the purpose of the marketing campaign? The goal is to to, to, we want to advertise a particular something or the bank now. They want to advertise something to the public, maybe a fixed deposit. So they want to know who and who will subscribe to that fixed deposit. So that means there will be, they may, and they may have an example of previous campaign they've done. In that previous data, they have a column that stands for uh, um, accept, like that, 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 that stands for the column that stands for whether the customer accepted to do that uh, uh, campaign or not. So where zero could be, no, they do not accept, one could be the accepted. So they have it already, they will tell you. Otherwise, that means you don't really know the problem you want to build the model for them. Why will you build the model? For you to build the model, you must understand what you want to use to be the model for. Otherwise, there must, it must start with a business problem. Bus there is a problem you want to tackle. That's why you are building the model. Hello, sir. Are we together? Yeah, I understand the very well. So you will always know. They will always tell you. Otherwise, you are uh, you can't just start building model. Okay. So are we all at the same page right now, Mr. Iman and Mr. Bolaji? Are we at the same page? Yes, sir. Okay. So now we have our data the features, the variables together, the target, uh, I mean, the target separately from the feature. Then the next thing, well, remember this is end-to-end -end model, or regression uh, model, to tackle a problem of building, building a model, but tackle a, a, a problem of building a model to, uh, for housing price. So now we, we, scale, we, we divide our data. Remember, we, we, we did that. So we divide our data into training, and to testing, where the training data will be used to build the model and the testing data will be used to validate the performance of the model. So we import from scikit-learn, uh, from scikit-learn model selection, um, from scikit-learn model selection, we import uh, a, a, a function called the train text split, okay? And then for, remember we specify 
our what we we want to uh, divide it, split it into X train and X test, also Y train and then Y test. So we call our function trait test split. What do we want to split into X train and X test? We want to split the features into X train and X test. X stands for the features. And then we want to split the target into Y train and Y test. Then we can specify how many percentage, this is optional, how many percentage of the data you want to use for building the model and you want to use for testing. If you don't specify it by default, it will use 75% to build the model and the remaining 25% to test the model. Remember, we have a very small data here, just 506. So we can, you can, we can go with the default 7525, but if you want to specify, you just specify the test size. Let's say I use, instead of 25%, I'm using 20%, 0.2. And then one final thing you should specify is the random state. I talked about that yesterday. It helps for reproducibility because this train test split is picking this 80% for the training randomly and the remaining 20% for testing, but it does that randomly. If you do not set this seed, this random seed, you can use any value, I'm using zero. You don't, you don't have to use zero, you can use one, you can use two, you can use 10. If you don't set it, the data that it picked when you first run it is not saved. If you run it again to pick 80% but different rows. So that means that your model is changing every time you are running that but we don't want that. So we want it that every time we run it, it should be picking the exact same data it picked when we first built the model so that we can have the same model not changing. So that's why we're doing that. Then we run that. You can check the shape now if you want to check the dimension of the training. Uh, you can see four, four now and the remaining one for tests, okay? So now we're using just one and two for tests. Your training should always be higher because that's what when you are building the model. The test is just to validate the performance. Then we now move to what we call standardization. Remember I talked about that, that you should always standardize or scale or normalize your data. Do anybody remember, does anybody remember why I said we should standardize our data? Yes, sir. Okay, can you help me, sir? To bring the, the the numerical values of each variables to, to a normal, as in to the same scale. Very, very correct, thank you. You are, yes, you want to bring all of the variables there, you want to bring them to similar scales, similar ranges, because remember I said, if some variables have higher ranges, why some have lower? The one with higher ranges, like maybe they range from zero to 5,000, why some one just range between zero and one? The one that have the higher range, we have larger impact on the model. They will overshadow the impact of the lower one. So that way your model may not really perform well. So it's always a good practice to standardize it. So there is a function to help us do that from scikit-learn uh, pre-processing. You know, this is pre-processing. We are trying to pre-process our data. So we've, we have we have option. We have what we call the standard scalar. We have another one called the mean max scalar. Um, so you can choose any one. I will explain both, but we use one of them. Standard scalar is from the world of statistics. It means that it helps you scale the data, uh, the variables, the features, such that they will have a mean of zero, mean average of zero, and a standard deviation of one. So if you use standard scalar, all of the variables will now be brought to similar scale such that their mean is zero and their standard deviation is one. But if you use mean mass scalar, uh, what happens is that it, brought, it brings all of the variables to a range of zero and one. So all of the variables will be ranging between zero and one. So I will use that and I will show you so that you can see, okay? So once you import that, you don't need to import the two, I only import the two for you to see. So uh, the first thing you instantiate it or you, you create an instance of it, just like we did 
uh, for, for the linear regression model yesterday. So you create an instance of it, let's call that scalar. Okay, so we have uh, a mean mass scalar, and then we can now use it to scale, to transform our training and test data. So let's call that X train uh, scale or STD. So we call our, the instance of this scalar that we just did now, the scalar dot, if you press star, we have fit transform, meaning if you just call just fit, what it will do, it will um, calculate the minimum and the maximum because the formula this, this mean mass scalar is doing, is using, is going to subtract the minimum from every, all of the variables and divide it by the difference between the minimum and maximum. If I do shift, uh, I think I've not run it, that's why. Okay, if I do shift tab here, let's see, oh, it's, not, it's not showing, but if I run it now, it will, uh, because I've not passed anything, I just want to show you. So if I show you, there is a formula there, see. It, it's, it's going to divide, um, see, see the formula here. This is it. So it's going to divide this it. So it's going to subtract the, the, the minimum and the max, max minus minimum divided by X max minus S min. So the formulas are actually here. So what it's doing is that it's subtracting the, the minimum and the maximum of each Z equivalent to me, max minus mean divided by x max minus x mean. So it's using a particular formula. You can see it here. So x stands for the variable. So you subtract the minimum of that of, for instance, let's pick a, a variable here. Let's say the room as a variable, as a feature. It's going to look for the minimum value, the minimum, the, uh, the minimum average, uh, the minimum value in that column, in that feature of number of rooms and subtract it from, from each row and then divide it by the difference between the maximum and the minimum. So if you just call ordinary fit, if I don't have this transform here, if I just do fit, it's only going to calculate it. It's not going to transform the model. It's not going to convert each uh, that row to a range of zero one. So that's why we normally call fit transform on the training set. But on the test set, you only call transform because you don't want to calculate another minimum and maximum. You only want to use the minimum and the maximum that you've calculated on the training to transform your testing. That's why we, for the test set, we only calculate, we only transform. We don't fit transform. If you fit transform on the test, that means you are working with, you are not working with the same similar data anymore because the minimum and the maximum of the test set will be different. So that way, the model will not understand the S test when you supply because it's going to be seeing a different minimum and different maximum. So that's why we call fit transform on the training and we use that minimum and maximum that is calculated when we call fit transform on the training to just transform our test. I don't know if my explanation is clear enough to us. Any question? Sir, I don't understand, sir. I don't, okay. I don't get you. Okay, so um, what I'm saying is this. For this, for this, uh, what this fit is doing, eh? let's pick a column in our, uh, a, a variable in our data. Let's say the variable is Indus that Mr. Aloze talked about there. So, and, and then we want to calculate this, um, we want to transform this using mean max. What it's doing is that it's going to pick each row in this indus, each row, and do, and subtract the minimum of that, of the whole of that variable. Remember, there are 506 rows of this industry. And each row stands for an example of the house in that area. So it's going to look for the minimum value in that row and subtract it for, from each row there and then divide it by this indus, which I represent by I, is going to subtract it by, as like it's going to divide it by the maximum, 
minus the minimum. This formula, this is the formula it's using. It's going to find the minimum in that column and the maximum. And then it's going to subtract from each row now the maximum and divide it by the difference of the, I mean, it's going to subtract the minimum from it and divide it by the maximum value and the minimum. Like in that row, let me, let me close this and show you, look at this data, okay? Um, look at this data now. We can find the minimum here. Suppose I, I select um, housing, I select the Indus, we can do dot mean. See, the minimum is 0 0.46 for this Indus. And you can do dot max. The maximum is 27.4. So for this formula now, what it will do is going to subtract from each row. From the first row, it's going to subtract the minimum 0 0.46 and then divide it by the difference of this maximum 27.4 and uh, 0 0.46. So it's for the first row, it's going to do something like, um, it's going to do like something like 2.31 minus the minimum, which is 0 0.46 divided by the maximum, which is 27. Point seven four minus the minimum zero point four six. So when it does that, the whatever it get becomes this it is when it gets that it's not going to use that to replace what it has as instead of two point three one, the value will be between zero point zero and one. If you check, if you do this, if you do point two point three one minus zero point four six divided by twenty seven point 74 minus this, you are going to get a value between 0 and 1. So that will now be used to replace 2.31. So it's going to do that for each row like that. Do you, do, okay, do you, do you understand what I'm that trying to do? Perfect, okay, so that's what that function is doing. So that's exactly what the function is doing, mean max. So it's going to do that for each row. So if you only call fit, it will only do that calculation, but it will not use that value to replace the 2.31 that we saw. It will not use it. It will only calculate it, but it will not use it to replace it. So that's why we call the transform. That's okay, why we don't, okay. that's why we call transform that okay, after you've calculated it, replace that value that you have used to calculate, replace it now instead of 2.31, replace it by the new value now before you move to the next row to do the same calculation. So that's what that fit transform is doing. But on the test, we don't need to calculate. Remember, the test is a different data. We don't need to now do the same calculation again. Because if you do that, the, the minimum of the test data will be different from the minimum of the training. And the same thing with the maximum. So if you do that, they are having that means the data will be having different information. Because they don't have the same minimum, they don't have the same maximum. So what we do, we only use the information in the training that we've transformed to just transform the test. Does it make sense to everybody? Yes, sir. Yes. OK. Good. All right. So now we've done that. We've transformed the training and the testing. Then we can now go and fit and train our model. Then we call on. So to do that, we have to import the linear regression from scikit-learn uh, linear model, from scikit-learn linear model, import um, linear regression. So the same thing, we create an instance of it, create an instance of the model, which I can use LR to be linear regression. And then I can now fit the model um, or train the model, LR.fit. Then we pass in 
Let's pass in, we're using our scaled data. So it's S-train STD, not the original X-train. And then you don't, you don't scale the targets, you don't scale the target. You only scale the futures, okay? So then, so this line, remember, we build the model. Then we can check the accuracy on both the training and testing to be sure the model is not overfitting. <laughs> Let me make it finer. So I will do train accuracy. So let me make it to four decimal place, the format, and then um, I can call my instance, then do the score and pass in the X train XTD, the same data you use to build it, Y train XTD. And I can do similar thing for the test set to check the uh, accuracy on the test set. I'll just change this to test accuracy and I'll do as test, as test. So if I do that, see, so I have a training accuracy of 77 and I have a test accuracy of 58.9. Any question before we try to interpret this result? Any question? Is it a lot to, to, to digest? Or is it, is it making, is it, is, are we, is it making sense? Like, are we, we are getting it more than the way we were yesterday. What do we, please talk to me. <laughs> it's, it's both too. It's what, both? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Mr. Alozi, I always like to hear your voice. Please talk to me. <laughs> it's getting more complicated. <laughs> it's getting more complicated. Is that what you said? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's getting more complex. Okay, I know Mr. Imano is having fun. Let me ask. Are uh, you how how talk to me, Mr. Imano? <laughs> uh, I think it's okay. It's okay. If I go through the video again, I'll be able to. <laughs> okay. Mr. Alize, be specific. What exactly is complicated? Which one? Linear regression is the simplest modulo, modelo. <laughs> so I which know. one? Which one? I which know. one is I, I know, but the thing there is, what I'm, what I'm saying is a little bit complicated. It's a kind of new, like I said earlier, yes, it's yes, new yes. to me. So I'm yes. trying to grasp it as you go along. Yes. And then compare it with my knowledge of uh, Excel. Okay. Uh, and well, so. you, Excel, Excel is also doing this underneath. But you will see, if you, you will see why you cannot stay with Excel <laughs> anymore. Excel will not be able to do ridge and lasso regression that we want to do. I will tell you why. Well, Excel cannot do logistic regression. Oh, uh, if you if, because those ones are generally uh, they, they are generalized linear model and statistics. So you Excel has limitation. It's good. Excel is very robust and powerful. Excel can do linear regression, but Excel may not be able to tweak the some parameters as you may want to do. So um, it's actually better to don't give yourself alternative if you do. Um, once it gets complicated, you want to go back to your alternative. So what you can I won't, I won't go back to Excel. I know why I'm doing. Okay. I know why I, I'm really interested in this. Exactly. No matter how complicated, I'm going to actually go to. Exactly. That's what I want to hear. So and I'm here, and I, that's why I'm trying to break it down. You know. So I mean, as you go over it, to go over it. If you have question, you can send email to me, or I mean, you you normally reach out. On WhatsApp too. So, but go over. I'm sure if you go over it, uh, I think you will understand. You will understand because I'm also trying to make sure I don't communicate this in in a high level. So go over it. They are not as complicated as you think. Yeah, they are not. Yeah, as you think. So just go over. It. So, but let's try to understand this accuracy now. In the light of what we've 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 discussed, 
The training accuracy is about 77%. The test accuracy is about 58.9. What do we think? Is there overfitting? Overfitting. Overfitting, sir. So that means this model is performing well on the, is at least not so well, but it's performing a little bit better on the training, but not so better. Is it just a little bit above 50%? on testing. So 50% probability in statistics means the model might be guessing. You know, if you want to guess, you have 50-50% chance of guessing right and wrong. So we can say this model is a little bit guessing for on the test. So that means the model is not really performing well. However, we may be, we may, we may try not to be too hard on the model because this model only has 506 rows to build, to, 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 uh, up to understand the pattern. So it only has 506 rules. It's not so, it's a very small data. Most times we like to, the more we like to use large data, okay? So that brings me to what the question I was asking yesterday, that what happens when uh, our model performs better on training, but worse on the test? So this leads to, since we say that's overfitting, this leads to what we call regularization. There are two ways you can undo that situation. So I think I, uh, Ms. Alizzi asked that question. So there are two ways. One, you need, maybe you need to get more data. In fact, that's the best, if, if it is possible. It's just that data could be very expensive to get. However, if your organization have more data, then, that would be the best option because most times when our model has large amount of data, it's very rare for the model to overfit. Yes, most times when the model overfit, that means the model is too complex for the data that we use to build it. So that's what is going on. So to solve that, suppose you, you don't, you've used a good amount of data and the model is still overfitting. Another thing you can do is what we call regularization. And in this case, so what do we mean by regularization? Regularization means, because what makes the model to be overfitting is that there are the coefficients of some coefficients or those Ws I showed you, some of them are high. So they are having large impact on the model. Because the larger those that be used, those coefficients of the variables, of the features in the data, the more the impact they will be having on the model. The larger they are, the more the impact. So, and the more the impact, the more complex the model will become. And when we make complex, we mean model that overfit. So that means we should find a way to restrict the coefficient, if we can find a way to reduce the impact of those coefficients, and by reducing their impact, we mean, is there a way to reduce those values of those Ws, of those coefficients? Because they are the one having high impact on the model, causing the model to be complex, causing the model to overfit. Is there a way to reduce their impact by reducing their values? That's what we mean by regularization. So regularization is the process of restricting or reducing the values of those coefficients in our model as a result, reducing their impact on the model. Should I repeat that definition? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. So remember we are coming from the aspect of that the more do, the coefficient, those Ws I showed us in our equation, W0, X0, W1, X1, remember each variable has an associated coefficient. So we are coming from the fact that the more those Ws, the higher they are, the more the impact they have on the model. And the more the impact they have on the model, the more complex the model becomes. And a complex model is a model that overfits to the training data. So we are saying, we are looking for ways to reduce these values, these values of those coefficients with the goal, because we know if we can reduce them, we will reduce the impact on the model. Thereby, we will reduce the effect of overfitting. 
So regularization is the process of reducing the values of those coefficients in our model, thereby reducing their impact on the model or reducing overfitting of our model to the training data. Is it clear? Sir. Yes. Sir. Can we say that you are introducing a bias to it or so? What do you buy bias? By, as in you're, you're trying to see how you can adjust this line so that um, it won't overfit. Yeah, so I, 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 I guess see. your question, but you know, by has by has is, is, is actually another name. So that's why I want to be sure you I, I get what you mean because uh, I mean I understand that maybe I'm trying in in deep learning we call that uh, um, uh, we, we we have a name for what you are trying to, like I'm reducing like I'm I'm as I'm making an assumption I'm I'm introducing a, a, a way of like what we call inductive bias but I don't want to go there but I understand what the your intuition like am I trying to like re, like introduce something to the model no not really not really because bias in the in regression actually means some form of error so that's why i am careful to say that because it means like <laughs> error a mistake a model is making something like that because that b okay that b in that equation i showed you is always called a bias term that's the kind of noise that is being introduced to the model to make the model robust. So that's why um, that term, Sam, it sounds <laughs> differently in my ear when you say that. But I understand what you're trying to say. Okay, it's just the term you use. Yes, sir. So, yeah, so it's not really, I'm not introduced, I'm just trying to solve to, you know, you have to do many things to make the model to perform better. So one of the things you will do if the model is overfitting, if you don't, if you have, is one is to get more data, but as soon as we have gotten it and the model is overfitting, the next thing is to look, maybe some coefficient is really, really having large impact. So they are, because they are, they are making the model to be complex. So we might have to reduce their impact and reducing their impact is what we call regularization. Does it make sense? Yes. You know? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So the question yes, is, how do we do that? Unfortunately, regression doesn't have a regularization term. Regression, if we look at linear regression here, let me expand it to see. It only has, look at the parameters there. It fits transform, normalize, which we have done. We've already normalized data, so we didn't set normalize here to be true. It's for it doesn't have a way, so that's why I told Miss Alice say that if in Excel you can only use the linear, and you don't have a way to regularize the model. So, one way to regularize the model in linear regression is to use ridge regression. So, what ridge regression is doing, ridge regression perform exactly like linear regression because it's also a linear model. Is very similar. It's like linear regression, just that in it, it only it, the only difference is that it has an additional parameter or yeah that can be used to regularize the model, to shrink, to reduce the impact of those coefficients. That's why I said it shrinks the high impact coefficient to nearly zero. So what regression will do is that it's going to look for the coefficients or the variables in our data that is having high impact. And it will shrink those values to be close to zero because the closer those values, those coefficients are to zero, the, more, the little impact they have on the model. The more, the higher those coefficients are, the more the impact they have, but the smaller those coefficients are, the closer they are to zero, the little impact they have. Remember, if they are actually equals to zero, that means that coefficient is not used at all. That variable is not used at all. But reach will not set it to zero. 
because it still want to use that coefficient, that variable, but you only want to reduce it to be close to zero, meaning I will make sure this, this variable does not have so much impact on the model. I don't know if I explain it, if you understand. Yes, sir. So, and that's exactly what you said at the right hand side here. So the, the middle line is the, where, the, where we have zero. So it's trying to bring what you see at the left hand side here, those, those red and green points to be close to zero. You can see that's why two are both in green color, two are above, two are below, bringing them to be close to zero. Not exactly that you can see the red, so close to zero. So that's what ridge regression is doing. It will re shrink the values of those coefficients to be very close to zero. The aim of doing that is that the smaller those coefficients, the smaller the impact they have, they will have on the model. So let's look at how to do that in uh, scikit lab And that leads us to what we call ridge regression. So, and I, that's why I'm saying that ridge regression is also a linear model for regression. So in ridge regression, the coefficient W are choosing not only so that they can predict well on trained data, but we have an additional constraint. We, want, we also want the magnitude of coefficient to be small, as small as possible. So that, that process is what we call regularization, which I've explained. So there is a parameter in ridge regression called the alpha parameter. That alpha parameter is the regularization parameter. The higher the alpha parameter, the more regularization you are applying on the model. And you know, by more regularization, we mean you are really, really shrinking those coefficients that have high impact to be close to zero. So you don't want the regularization to be too much and you don't want it to be too small. If they are too much, most of the coefficient will be close to zero and you might have a very simple model. Simple model is a model that underfit. Complex model is a model that overfits. So you want to try to balance it. You want to try to, so most time you can check, you can try to run a for loop and build this model for different values of alpha. So first from scikit learn um, linear model, let's, let's import the uh, reach from scikit learn linear model import. Let's press tab, we have reach. No, it should be capital letter. Yep, reach, then let's create an instance of it. So instantiate the model. So let's call it reach. Okay. Uh, so for now, I'm not adjusting the parameter. I'm using the default parameter. The same way we just train it by calling dot fit on the X train, XTD, the scaled one, and then the Y train. And then let me just copy my out this one so that I don't waste time on that. Let's check the accuracy on the training and testing. So I will just change, instead of LR, it will be reach. It will be reach. So, so what do you observe? Hello, Does, is there any change from 77 to 76.9 and from 58 to 57? So let's check the alpha parameter. So it's using an alpha of 1.0. We might need to improve to re, like increase it. Let's check, let's see what it's doing. Is that this model solves a regression model where the loss function blah, blah is least square, also known as ridge regression. Let's see alpha, regularization strength, that's the alpha. It must be a positive float. So regularization improves the conditioning of the problem and reduces the variance of the estimate. Larger values specify stronger regularization. So, we might need to increase it because it looks like the model is still overfitting. So let's set, instead of one, maybe we should use, or you can create it as a new model. 
let's create maybe for 10 and see. So what so what you can use a for loop so that we can try as many? You you can do that, can't you? Can't you do that? <laughs> yeah, you can. Yeah, you just run a for loop like maybe you, you create alpha value separately. Uh, maybe you, you, you create 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 1 0.0, um, 2, you know, 2.0, 5.0, 7.0, and then 10. In zero, you can do that. And then you do for i in, for i in, um, range of maybe we want to run it uh, or range of the length of alpha, things like that. Range of the length of alpha. And then you put your, all of those code above, you just put it under it, but you make sure you, you, you get the indentation correctly. So instead of printing, I can create the training accuracy here. Train accuracy as an empty list, test accuracy as an empty list. So instead of printing, all I would just do, um, I would just append it. So all I would just do, oh, I was doing in a different place. Let's see it. So, so I will just do my train accuracy dot append and append all of that to read. And I will just do test accuracy dot append and append all of that to read since I've created empty sets up there. So, and then at the end, I can check my training and test accuracy. I can even plot it. So if I do all of these, sorry, I there's dots there. So if I do all of that, I already run it. Before you plot, you can check it, train, Accuracy, if you do that, you can see you have four, but unfortunately it didn't change. You can see the train accuracy was exactly the same for all of them. Or oh, anyway, I didn't, I didn't do that. I can set my, my alpha to alpha. So I can do, like do this for high in range of, um, yeah, yeah, I was correct here, length of, my alpha, mm -hmm. then alpha i. Well, I, I don't really need that. So what I want to do, let, let me just speak it for i in alpha. Okay, mm -hmm. okay for i in alpha, yes. Then I can just set my, this guy right. to this. So that for each case, it's gonna be picking for alpha. So the very first time it's gonna pick I is going to pick 0 0.1 and then build this model and use the value it picked and then fit it here and then get the accuracy, then it go back again and do all of that. So if I check it here now, they should be different. You can see they are different. So, and then you can check the test accuracy too. So, let me, so you can see, but unfortunately, because the data is very small, <laughs> there wasn't yes. so much impact of it. It's, it's just small. So this could be that after you have tried regularization, it could be that your data is small. So maybe you need to get more data, something like that. You understand? So that's what you uh, what you do. But at least you try to be sure that the problem is not from the uh, uh, some some coefficient. So that's how to do that. So you can try that. We can even plot it. You can just plot it. You can use your math plot, leave, uh, uh, do your PLT, 
dot show uh dot scatter or something like that dplt dot plot you know then plot your train accuracy uh something like that you can give it a label uh, since we want to plot two things this should be our train accuracy and then we also plot our uh the the test test accuracy and then we'll give it a label to be um test accuracy and then since we are plotting two things at the same time we can use our legend a legend and set our location to be best okay and then we are good we can we can even show it we can just oh the mplt dot show so if we do that this is going to plot both the training and testing and then if you want to label you can label it you know things like that that your your y label should be your accuracy plt dot y label uh should be the accuracy things like that and your s should just be the number of iterations or the the your s is just the not the length that you have there so if you do that you can see that for all of them the training accuracy that's in blue is always higher than the testing do you did do you understand what i'm trying to do here Hello. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm I hope I'm side. not confusing you. No, it's you okay. Say? It's okay. <laughs> okay. Mr. Abalaji, are you there? I'm with you, sir. Okay. So you can see. So all we are trying to do is that these are the regularization time. We wanted to check maybe regularization will have impact on the model. Maybe it will help us increase the test accuracy. So that's why we try different values. So we are using the follow we've done before that, okay, for I in each values of alpha. So pick the first time 0 0.1, build the model, but use alpha of 0 0.1, fit it, train it, and get the accuracy and append it to this train accuracy there. Get the test and append it there. Do for the second one, do for all of these. And then we plot it, we show it here to see. Instead of looking at pure values, let's show it. Let's see. So we saw that for all of the uh, values we pick, which was from zero to like around seven, like we have more than even that we have more than 10. So for all of that, which 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 one? We saw that the, the, the model overfit, actually overfitted from beginning to the end. So that means the problem may not be from the question, it may be that we need more data, something like that. Next class, I will show another uh, way to regularize using lasso regression. But for the few minutes, so that people will have an understanding of what to do, of what we have done, I want you to practice this. Now, I don't mean at all, you will do that now. Using the second data in that folder that you downloaded the usa underscore housing data set you have it so you, i want you to practice everything we've just done uh explore the data you already know how to do that build a linear regression model if it overfits try ridge regression and see maybe it will have any effect so at this i'm going to stop recording uh